Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I want to discuss the symmetrization postulate in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. We found on the video in Exchange Degeneracy that we can build an infinite number of apparently equivalent states to describe a system of identical quantum particles. However, we also found that applying the usual rules of quantum mechanics leads to different predictions depending on which of these states we choose. This is clearly a big problem. Today, we will resolve this by introducing a new postulate, the symmetrization postulate. This will allow us to recover the predictive power of quantum mechanics when we have multiple identical particles. On top of that, we will introduce ideas like bosons and fermions that you'll probably have heard about. So, let's go. Before we introduce the symmetrization postulate, let's start with a refresher about two prerequisite topics. Let's start with symmetric and antisymmetric states. If we act with any permutation p alpha on a state psi plus and we get psi plus back, then psi plus belongs to a subspace called v plus and we say that it is a totally symmetric state. Similarly, if we act with any permutation p alpha on a state psi minus and we get back eta alpha psi minus, then this state belongs to a subspace called v minus and we say that it is a totally antisymmetric state. In this expression, eta is plus one for even permutations and minus one for odd permutations. We also know that we can construct this totally symmetric or antisymmetric state by applying an appropriate projection operator on an arbitrary state. The first projector is S plus, and it is defined by one over n factorial, multiplying the sum over all n factorial permutations p alpha. S plus projects any state psi onto a totally symmetric state, and we call it the symmetrizer. The second projector is S minus, and it is defined by 1 over n factorial multiplying the sum over eta alpha p alpha running over all permutations again. S minus projects any state psi onto a totally antisymmetric state, and we call it the antisymmetrizer. The second prerequisite topic is exchange degeneracy. Consider a ket psi belonging to the state space V of an n particle system of identical particles which as usual is given by the tensor product of a single particle state spaces. Also consider the n factorial kets p alpha psi given by all possible permutations of the n particles. The set of kets span a subspace of v called v psi, and any state in v psi is a state that mathematically describes the same situation. This is what we call exchange degeneracy. However, in the video on exchange degeneracy we found a big problem. Any state in v psi mathematically describes our system, but when we use them to make physical predictions using the usual rules of quantum mechanics, we get different answers depending on which state we choose. Clearly this is a problem for any physical theory, so exchange degeneracy needs to be removed. Which state describes the physical system? As we will see, the symmetrization postulate allows us to solve this problem. If you want a more in-depth discussion about these topics, check the corresponding videos in the description. Otherwise, Let's go on to the symmetrization postulate. The symmetrization postulate says that for a system of identical particles, the only kets of its state space that can describe physical states are the following. Either totally symmetric kets with respect to permutations of identical particles, and the particles that obey these are called bosons, or the only other option is totally antisymmetric kets with respect to permutations of identical particles, and the particles that obey these are called fermions. Let's stop here for a moment. Does it make sense that systems of identical particles are described by these two types of state? We know that exchanging two identical particles doesn't affect the physics of the problem. This is actually precisely what these states do. Bosons are particles described by totally symmetric states for which exchanging any two particles leads to exactly the same state. Fermions are particles described by totally antisymmetric states for which exchanging any two particles leads to the same state with an extra minus sign. This means that these states capture the necessary property of systems of identical particles that exchanging any two particles should not affect the physics. Remember that for n distinguishable particles, the state space V is the tensor product space of single particle state spaces V1, V2, all the way to Vn. What the symmetrization postulate tells us is that for a system of n identical particles, then the combined state space is no longer v. Instead, it is one of two subspaces of v, either v plus, spanned by the totally symmetric states, or v minus, spanned by the totally antisymmetric states. 
The symmetrization postulate implies that all particles in nature can be classified into two groups, bosons and fermions. The question that emerges is how do we know if a given particle is a boson or a fermion? In introductory quantum mechanics we will use an empirical rule derived from experiment to answer this question. 1. Particles with integer spin are bosons. Examples include elementary particles like photons, but also non-elementary particles like mesons, made of two quarks, or helium-4, an isotope of helium made of two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. 2. Particles with half-integer spin are fermions. Examples include elementary particles like electrons or muons, and non-elementary particles like protons or neutrons, each made of three quarks, or helium-3, another isotope of helium made of two protons, one neutron, and two electrons. For elementary particles, their spin is an intrinsic defining property. For non-elementary particles, we need to combine the spins of the elementary particles making them up in the usual manner to decide what the total spin is. For example, as quarks are spin one-half particles, then a meson that has two quarks will have integer spin, so it is a boson. A proton that has three quarks will have half integer spin, so it is a fermion. As I said earlier, in introductory quantum mechanics, the relation between spin and the bosonic or fermionic nature of particles is taken as an empirical rule. In quantum field theory, which roughly speaking is the extension of quantum mechanics to include the effects of special relativity, there is something called the spin statistics theorem, in which this empirical rule is derived rather than assumed. However, the spin statistics theorem itself is in turn based on more general hypotheses that also have to be taken as given without proof. The reason why we had to introduce the symmetrization postulate is because of exchange degeneracy. So what we have to show now is that the symmetrization postulate allows us to remove exchange degeneracy and recover the ability of quantum theory to make predictions about nature when we have a system of identical particles. Consider a ket psi in the tensor product space V. Then the kets P alpha psi span the subspace V psi and any ket that lives in this subspace is a mathematically valid ket and this is precisely what we call exchange degeneracy. On the other hand, the symmetrization postulate tells us that the physically allowed kets live in either V plus for bosons or V minus for fermions. This means that what we have to show is that of all possible kets in V psi, there is only one that also lives in V plus or V minus. The proof in fact is very simple and relies on these results up here that we obtained in the video on symmetric and antisymmetric states. The first shows that the symmetrizer S plus commutes with all permutations and that both terms are equal to S plus. And the second that the antisymmetrizer S minus commutes with all permutations and both terms are equal to eta alpha S minus. Let's now consider a ket psi that lives in V psi. To follow the symmetrization postulate, we must symmetrize this state. And we do this by applying the symmetrizer S plus on psi, which gives a state that lives in V plus. Now let's consider permutation P alpha psi, which also lives in V psi. Following the symmetrization postulate again, we must symmetrize this state. And to do this, we again apply the symmetrizer S plus on P alpha psi. We can now use the result up here that S plus P alpha equals S plus to get this equal to S plus psi. And this is again a state that belongs to V plus. So what does this mean? Starting from two different cats psi and P alpha psi, both in V psi, when we symmetrize them, we end up with the same state here and here in V plus. So why is this result so important? Of all the possible permutations of a ket psi that live in V psi and are responsible for exchange degeneracy, when we apply the symmetrization postulate and project these states onto V plus, we get the exact same state. This means there are no longer multiple states, but a single one, so that the symmetrization postulate removes exchange degeneracy. We can of course make a similar argument if we apply the anti-symmetrizer on a permutation of psi. Remember that S minus P alpha equals eta alpha S minus, so we get this. We again find that any permutation of a ket psi anti-symmetrizes to the same state, in this case up to a minus sign. This means that we also remove exchange degeneracy for fermions using the symmetrization postulate. Overall, of all the permutations of a state that we have in the state space V, we have a single state in the symmetric and antisymmetric spaces V plus and V minus.
We can therefore say that d ket that describes a physical state for bosons is s plus psi, and for fermions it is s minus psi. Now that we have seen how the symmetrization postulate allows us to remove exchange degeneracy, the only thing that is left to discuss is how we go about constructing, from all the mathematically allowed kets, the physical ket for our system of identical particles. The procedure is pretty straightforward, and in the rest of the video we'll show a few examples of how to build multiparticle states in quantum mechanics. Let's start with the simplest possible example, a two-particle system. Let's imagine that one particle is found in the single particle state phi, and the other in the single particle state chi. To construct the physical states, the first step is to arbitrarily associate each of the two kets with a particle, say ket phi with 1, and ket chi with 2. Then we build the state psi as the tensor product of phi 1 and chi 2, which belongs to the tensor product state space v. Remember that we can use a simpler notation that omits the tensor product symbol, like this. The second step is to project this state onto the v plus and v minus subspaces. If we apply the symmetrizer to psi, we can then explicitly write out the two permutations, p12 and p21 acting on psi, which we also write out. And using the action of the permutation operators, we get this. This state corresponds to bosons. If we apply the anti-symmetrizer to psi, we can then again write out the relevant terms here, and we get this. The state has an additional negative sign and corresponds to fermions. The third and final step is to normalize the state. We need to distinguish two situations. The first corresponds to phi different from chi. In this case, the normalized states are simply 1 over square root of 2, phi 1 chi 2 plus minus chi 1 phi 2. The second case corresponds to phi equal to chi. For bosons, we have this and combining the two terms reduces to the original state that is already normalized. In this case, the original state was already symmetric with respect to particle exchange. For fermions, we get this. But now combining these two states actually gives zero. What does this mean? There is no ket in V- minus that can describe this physical state. This result is a very striking feature of the quantum theory of identical particles and is called the Pauli exclusion principle. Two identical fermions cannot be in the same single particle state. I bet you have all heard before about the Pauli exclusion principle, which is an extremely famous result. It features in many areas, for example in atomic structure, where it tells us how to arrange electrons in atoms, and gives rise to the structure of the periodic table of elements. Let's now look at a three-particle system. The single particle states are phi, chi, and omega. Step one is to build psi like this, again randomly associating each state with a particle. In step two, for bosons, we apply the symmetrizer on psi. Explicitly writing the symmetrizer gives this. And we can then expand the sum with all six permutations of three elements, and we get six terms, phi chi omega, omega phi chi, chi omega phi, phi omega chi, chi phi omega, omega chi phi. In step three, let's consider various situations. First, if phi, chi and omega are all different, then the normalized state is simply given by the same six terms we just got in step two, but now the prefactor is one over square root of six. Second, if phi and chi are equal but different to omega, then we get this normalized state in which we only have three different terms. And the normalization prefactor is 1 over square root of 3. And third, if all single particle states are equal, then the state is simply this one term. What about fermions? Now in step 2 we need to apply the anti-symmetrizer on psi which explicitly is given by this. And if we expand it out, it looks very similar to the one for bosons. We also get six terms. The first three are the same, phi chi omega, omega phi chi, chi omega phi. But the last three terms have a negative sign, 
minus phi omega chi, minus chi phi omega, and minus omega chi phi. This negative sign arises because the terms correspond to odd permutations. For fermions, if any two of phi, chi, or omega are equal, then this expression will be zero, and the normalization is therefore always the same for fermions. All we have to do is to replace the term here by the square root to obtain a normalized state. This vanishing of the fermionic state, if any two single particle states are the same, is again the Pauli exclusion principle. These ideas are all easily generalized to an arbitrary n-particle system, whose single particle states are labeled by phi1, phi2, and so on. First, we build the ket psi as the tensor product of the single particle states where they are ordered in an arbitrary fashion. Second, for bosons we apply the symmetrizer on psi, and we obtain this. When this bosonic state is represented in the position basis in terms of wave functions, this object is sometimes called the permanent. For fermions, we apply the anti-symmetrizer on psi, and we get this. When this fermionic state is represented in the position basis in terms of wave functions, the signs introduced by the eta alpha obey the same rules as those introduced by the calculation of a determinant. This means that we can then rewrite this expression in terms of a determinant of the single particle wave functions, and because such determinants appear whenever we have a system of identical fermions, they have a special name. They are called Slater determinants. Third, always remember to normalize. Today we have resolved the big problem that exchange degeneracy posed. In doing that, we have seen that all particles in nature are either bosons, described by totally symmetric states, or fermions, described by totally antisymmetric states. The simple difference between bosons and fermions has massive consequences for the behavior of these two types of particles, some of which can even be observed microscopically. I'll give you two quick examples. The symmetric states of bosons mean that they can all collapse to the same quantum state to form something called the Bose-Einstein condensate, also called the fifth state of matter. The Pauli exclusion principle, obeyed by fermions, means that there is an effective force that can even counteract gravity. This is precisely the force that stabilizes neutron stars and prevents their gravitational collapse. If you liked the video, or would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.